according to the SO5 model, please, that you must help me with, but it's, you understand, what are the root causes of crime? Now, that you'll see that they've listed. What are the motivation to commit crime? There's the drug lords. And, and what is interesting is that, you know, that's the, the answer. Here you've got community people that can go and take that kind of pictures, yet the police say they don't know where's the drug lords. <laughs> You know, the, uh, why is it that the information is there? Communities are getting frustrated because they, they can show us where everything is happening. How do we create government as a partner, capable partner, including responding to those issues? So, but anybody that's interested in the pictures, we've got all over 4,000 pictures taken throughout the province and it's available to, to anybody or everybody that, that would like to use it. Chairperson, with that, I thank you. I'm very keenly aware that I appear to be what stands between here and the sunshine outside. So, with that in mind, I will keep on time and I'll do my best to, at some level, if not entertain, provide some sort of a a different perspective, in a way, an antidote to some of the situations we've been describing, uh, that have been described, and a lot of what we dealt with yesterday in terms of some of the, uh, the harsh, the traumatic realities of violence, the lack of safety and security in our city, province, and country. So I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about the safety lab, what it is, and a little bit of history. I'm going to give a high-level overview of three projects that we're involved in as an example of what we do. And then I'm going to take a slightly deeper dive into Nyanga, which is a, a word, the name of a police precinct um, that's been mentioned a couple of times over the last couple of days, which has a reputation of having the, uh, the highest murder rate in the country, which is not technically correct. It has the largest number of murders in any police precinct in the country. So I have a fascinating job because my job is to make this happen, right? Effective, innovative, street-ready approaches to safety and security. That's my role. I run a small organization called the Safety Lab. We are, uh, we are the midget surrounded by the giants of government departments sitting around me. Uh, a tiny team, a uh, full-time team of five, incubated out of Cape Town Partnership, close uh, uh, alliance with UCT Center of Criminology. I know many of the individuals in the room, many of the individuals in the room have you know, worked with us, collaborated with us. We set ourselves up a year and a half ago, so it's still early days. And we arise out of the strategic objective, strategic objective number five, in fact, that uh, Michael referred to. And ultimately, what, what the lab brings is an approach rather than a solution. So I won't go into detail on any of the next few pages, but, but our job is to ask what happens here find out what some of the breaks in a value chain might be where resources applied in a certain area can have a disproportionate impact and figure out if these are things that the lab can do. So I'm no criminology expert. In fact, arguably, I'm not an expert about very much at all. I have a finance background, business consultant. My job over more than a decade has been working with large companies, mostly multinationals, helping to set strategies, set up their organizations, and help them do whatever they do better, mining operations, distributing soft drinks in North Africa, whatever the case might be. So I have a business background. And what's clear coming in as a, as a novice into this field is the distinction between what I would call an inquiry-led approach and a policy-led approach. Now this is the benefit of a small organization relative to government departments. Government, and I'm going to simplify hugely and you guys will correct me if I'm wrong, ultimately has a mandate to be able to Scale up. You need policy. You need to have generalizable policy that can be applied in many areas. The problem with that is all areas tend to be different. So going in with saying, how can I apply my policy into this area, straight away runs the risk of asking the wrong question because it assumes that the solution lies in that policy rather than, wait a minute, there's something completely different going on here. And I'll give a couple of specific examples about that. But so our job is to ask questions, to challenge, but come up with locally useful things that the lab actually can do with its relatively small resources. So I'm going to talk about three projects. The one is using CCTV material as a basis for 
education of the public around safety and security. The second is around uh, some mobile technology that we've developed that gives mechanism to the giving responsibly message. All of you who live in Cape Town will have seen the give responsibly messaging around city center. That's all very well to have the message, but there's no alternative that's actually been developed. How do I give responsibly? Right now it's a not statement. Don't give at street corners. And thirdly, local activation of what the jargon might refer to as pro-social entertainment or edutainment in a violent context which is younger. I'm going to go very briefly through this because this isn't the focus of what I want to talk about, but just as an example of what the lab does. So we ask the question, what happens to all the footage that's taken in these 650-odd CCTV cameras in Cape Town and Sarans? And the short answer for almost all of it is absolutely nothing, right? So a tiny percentage of the footage is used in apprehension, real time, and conviction. And then footage relating to prosecutorial processes is ultimately embargoed and owned by the police. But we all know that we have single-digit conviction rates for most reported crimes. And so if you work through the numbers, a tiny percentage of this footage is ever used. And so our question, which led to a very interesting experimental project with City of Cape Town and Metro is, how else can you use this? It's a sunk cost. And so what we did, in short order, is we identified half a dozen crime types, non-violent, very low grade as the tone of this conversation has gone, but crime types that occur in the CBD that are typically interpersonal, property related, non-violent, and where they have two additional criteria. One, knowing how it works can take you out of the target pool. If you don't leave a laptop on the seat in front of you, you will not be smash and grabbed at Vanguard Drive. If you listen to the beep or watch your lights go off when you lock your car, your car will not be jammed by a remote control device so that someone can open your boots, take your laptop, and insurance not pay because there's no sign of forced entry in your car. So very simple stuff, but where that was the one criteria. And the other criteria is that sort of prevention doesn't carry the risk of escalation, unlike in a domestic violence context, for instance. So we put together a cartoon format based on real footage. About 50,000 booklets were distributed around the CBD uh, over last Christmas. About a third of those by Metro offices. And our plan right now is to figure out um, where we do this in the most effective way. We're most likely, if you watch the press in the next couple of weeks, we may or may not have something quite uh, daring going on around Long Street relating to this sort of thinking. Um, and more broadly, how can one use this sort of thinking to say, how can we change the mode of communication about safety and security in a way that informs rather than terrifies? Second example is the project that we call GEVA. At its, at its narrow focus, it's an intent to give capacity to the desire to give responsibly. And simply what it is, and it, it is to the extent that we've developed a trial version of the software together with Young and Rubicam, our ad agency partner in this venture. We put 30,000 Rand into a very localized trial using real money going to real N NGOs. And it's a way to use social, a social media type of platform for me as an individual to give to an individual, an individual in an accredited NGO. But right now, I give to the Haven Night Shelter or the Homestead or Community Chester. Wave. I give to an organization. I am tell the story about the individuals who might receive money of the sort but I'm not giving to an individual. I'm giving to an organization. I'm to whom I then have, imagine, a prepaid currency that I can say, nice idea, I've tracked this guy, he's off the streets, I see he needs a, 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 a bridging program because he's actually an accountant who fell off the bandwagon and has been on you know, drugs for the last five years. It costs a thousand rand, I'll give 200 rand to that guy and I'm going to watch who else gives and I'm going to track his progress. So, as of, so here's an example of the, the real needs that might be uploaded, the program we ran included uh, uh, an NGO that works on the ground in Blickiesdorp, outside Cape Town. And as of a couple of days ago, this platform uh, has been announced as one of the World Design Capital projects. 
Uh, there are a lot of them. There's about 450 of them. So it's not like it's a hugely exclusive little pool, but that does give us broader publicity. And we're currently in discussions with a couple of large organizations about a, uh, a longer term project to take the platform from the lab, which is a narrow safety and security program, and ultimately help develop this as, if this works, it's a new way of driving individual and even more importantly, corporate social investment into um, social impact projects. Thirdly, how am I doing on time? I will try to use it wisely. So we were asked as the lab to get involved in Younger, and Younger's reputation precedes it. We did two things. We did some qualitative research where we sent um, some market researchers who work out of Google Etu into Younger, and we said, tell us a story on video of what happens here, how violence happens, where it happens. Unless we have time later, I'm not going to play that video. I'll play you a different video shortly. We also looked at all the data that exists, mortuary statistics, we looked at 260 court inquests, in other words, um, deaths ostensibly relating to violence that hadn't been solved because there was no witness or no witnesses came forward and so on, so about 260 court inquests um, uh, within the Weinberg Magistrates Court, we looked at uh, Department <coughs> of Health figures, we looked at a whole lot of heat maps, and so I'm going to paint with very broad brush strokes here, and some of this might be a little bit heretical. The first, the first insight we got is Nyang is appallingly, appallingly violent, but not an outlier, right? So um, the guys at Amandla Edu Football yesterday mentioned some of the murder rates in Kailicha. Cape Town faces three different violence clusters. You've got the shadow of the mountain, the more affluent, relatively low violence communities, murder rates of, let's say, up to 40 murders per 100,000. You've then got the working class communities, typically colored working class communities, often facing very strong structured gang violence. Mannenberg, Hanover Park, Lavender Hill, they have murder rates of roughly in the 40 to 70 per 100,000 category, roughly. And then you have the poor, very violent black townships, Kailicha with the two police stations there, Nyanga places of this nature, and they place mur face murder rates that are typically around 100 to 150. In other words, these areas are way more violent in terms of murder and other reported levels of violence, uh, assault, GBH, and so on, than the structured gang-ridden areas that in many cases get more publicity. So Nyanga is at the extreme of a continuation of five police stations in a broader context where there is nothing about Nyanga that's an outline completely different. It's much of the same, but more so, is the first insight we got. The second insight we got is around the role of demographics. So, put simply, the percentage of 20 to 25 year olds that showed up dead in Nyanga was higher than the surrounding five stations in the police cluster. Roughly, if I recall, roughly 45% were in the bracket, whereas in Athlone, for instance, it's about 32%. So significantly different. When, you, when we look deeper, what's apparent is that the, the demographic curve, the age curve in younger, is actually skewed to youth. You then look a little closer. Levels of unemployment, even in the six stations in the cluster, are higher than in the rest of the cluster. Urban density is higher, and so on. Now, none of these figures are terribly accurate. At this stage, it was previous census. Obviously, unemployment figures are you know, notoriously inaccurate in terms of what they measure. But the bottom line is that we could construct a very clear understanding at some level of the, the, among the reasons why Nyanga is more violent is very, very much the fact that there are more young men, mostly unemployed, almost all single, in part tied to their unemployment and economic status, living in closer proximity who were involved in the violence. So the stories we're reading through the court inquest is around young men, approximately 25 years old, unemployed, presumed single, found beaten to death in a field, last seen stealing something from a washing line. A lot of stories of this nature came out of the inquest. So demographics generally play a role. Alcohol, the ravages of alcohol, I think, have been yeah, our legion are well proven, have been made clear. <laughs> but what's interesting about our understanding of alcohol in younger is that it doesn't have very much causal 
explanatory powers to why younger is more dangerous. Alcohol shows up significantly in younger as it does elsewhere. No evidence we could find that, it's, that there's more violence in younger because there's higher levels of consumption. You can't get those figures. You can say that there are more shabins, but to the extent that a third of the shabins are three or four person shabins that you can argue are substitutes for your living, your living room, it's unclear whether a greater concentration of shabins meet, meet, means a greater consumption of alcohol. What is clear is that as with our pathology around drinking, those that drink, drink a lot. So if you look at murder victims in younger, roughly half, slightly more than half, have no blood alcohol or a very little. But then when you look at the blood alcohol component, it starts going up through the roof, right? To the extent that about 10 or 15% of them medically yeah, are, are approaching significant, significant health issues just by virtue of their drinking. And this ties into a lot of the anecdote one hears about uh, the competitive drinking, the mixing of uh, low-grade vodka with alcohol, the mixing of various drugs. So alcohol serious. Tick, on the other hand, is almost entirely unmeasured for the simple reason that um, all deaths that, all deaths that uh, are, are, uh, might be murder are automatically, uh, the, uh, there's automatically a test for blood alcohol, whereas there's only a test for drug toxicology in situations where SAPS determines that it's a gang-related murder. So while in our sample 80 to 90 percent of murders had blood alcohol, in a place like Nyanga, where only now are SAPs starting to determine a lot of the, uh, lot of the violence is being gang-related, the presence of tick and other substances simply isn't checked. The boundaries of the project we're involved in, which is in a broader VPU framework, and I think the guys are talking about this next, part of the challenges is that one can't cover everywhere, and the physical boundaries of that project exclude the areas that, by reputation and by SAPs testimonial, are the greatest generators of violence. So the informal settlements. So according to SAPS, 50 to 70 percent of the violence emanates from bronze farms and bronze farm in those areas. The problem, of course, which relates to my last point, is that SAPS won't actually give you their data. So they'll say it comes from there. Can you see the figures? Now, unofficially, you can see a lot of these figures, but you can't officially see the figures. And so underneath all of this, there is legion of just bad data and misunderstanding going out there. And examples of this that we've encountered and that confounded us initially were heat maps that were based on ostensibly on ambulance location from a GPS device but actually the GPS device wasn't working and so the heat map triangulation is based on caller identification at the time of call-in and the caller says I'm near Lansdowne Road and the system automatically assumes you're in the middle of Lansdowne Road so it looks like a very nice heat map that focuses on a couple of the high streets with a red dot in the middle is based on data that's completely incorrect and so as we started unpacking some of the, the common truths about Nyanga, what became clear is that the reality is much more complex. But underneath the reality, what we started finding, underneath all of the, the role of alcohol, the policy to close down shabins, the issues with local police, is that there is, by and large, very little else for me to do as a 20-year-old or a 25-year-old in Nyanga, other than go to a tavern, which is legal, or a shabin, which is illegal, there's really nothing else for me to do in terms of structure consistent programming. Nothing. We started out, we started out by saying, we hear that there are little bits of things happening. Let's communicate it. New York has time out, London has time out. We want to program for Nyanga. We got very quick early success on that. We had about 7,000 registered users on Mixit, which worked on the platform that worked best. The issue is that most of what was coming to us as a description of programming flat out didn't exist. Basketball, Zolani Center, two to four, three days a week, fantastic. There's nothing there. And so we went back to the drawing board and started getting into the slightly uncomfortable position of developing programming ourselves in part through some of the locals that showed initiative in whatever it might be, yoga, boxing, skateboarding, etc. So we got Zolani Center, we got some activation of that, and now if the chair will permit me, I have a short video that's about three minutes. I'm going to go one minute over time. But this shows, this shows what we're actually doing on the ground. And the key point I want to make in this is we are looking for safety outcomes, but the way that we're going to attract the demographics we want is not by talking about safety. 
we are trying to activate a community center by against the odds making it cool and that means that there is no branding of government there's no branding of saps there's no branding of safety this video talks about safety but the communication to the kids and the youth and younger has no conversation about safety in terms of the mechanism yeah by to castellate a car let we play the ball we dance we take a chance to the movie screaming, boxing and skateboarding. Open mic night, we stop the fight. You gotta get up, stand up, your gap up. You gotta groove. Tell your mama, your pussy, your sister, your tata. We got a script, we do the drama. No more crying, no more crying, no more fight, no more fight. It all starts tonight. Yanga here to 7755, represent her. Generally, in a lot of township areas, there's not a lot, a lot of activities to do. I mean, you have a youth centre, but many of the youth centres aren't activated with any children. We know that Nyanga East is a notorious uh, township. The aim is to take these children out of the streets. We've worked on different programs and we've tried different things. We've been doing movies from Friday to Sunday. Outside world is kind of like too much for them. When they are here, I can see that they are actually happy. Dance is a therapy for the, the young kids, and physically and mentally. We discipline them in in art and culture. We try to find ways that we get kids out of the streets so that they can be active. To win in boxing, we have the hard work, first of all, we must train hard. So through boxing, I want to teach the kids that hard work pays. They put in something as positive, but say, whoa, a space where they have an opportunity to showcase what they have to give. It's a language, it's, it's, a, it's a way of communicating. It's an art form. So I feel that if every person had access to it, they could actually feel a part of something bigger than themselves. The fundamental precept of yoga is about connecting you back into your own body. It's also about fostering self-respect and respect for others. So we are opening the mic night uh, essentially just to capacitate MCs who are not well known and to get them to the platform where they can get their voices. This is also to, to date Nyanga as a crime society can change it with their music and with their messages. It's bringing some change in the community. If people can just back and support what um, what these kids are doing, this could also be used to skyrocket them into their future. We are showing them that they can do anything that they want to be in life. I think that there's such a lot of social ills in our communities um, that this especially has just helped divert that focus and for them to channel all their energy into something positive. Thank you. Thanks so much, Noah. Thanks so much to all our panelists. We now have about 20 minutes for comments and questions. Um, and then we're going to break for a few coffee breaks. So I'd like to open the floor. Um, if you have a comment or question, please can you just identify yourself as well. To, um, you know, even though we've been together for a day before this, not everyone knows everyone. Um, start with Ian, and I'll go to Jane. Um.